I'm going to um, indulge in a small game here to start off called Date That Prophet. The prophets being prophets of the new age of globalization that is just about to come, a new age that will transcend space and time. So if you want to play along, you may like to write down these four dates on a, on a piece of paper. You um, can test yourselves. I'm going to read four quotations for you, and you can match the quotations to the dates. Um, give you a minute there. 1852, 1893, 1917, and 1957. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other as they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathways over and under the sea, as well as on the earth. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. <laughs> Two. It has become commonplace that we are in the midst of a great world revolution. The rapidly accelerating spread of literacy, mass communications, and travel, which has only begun, will produce unsettling results over the coming years. The revolution is rapidly exposing previously apathetic peoples to the possibility of change. It is creating in them new aspirations for education, social improvement, and economic development. At the same time, it is breaking down traditional institutions and culture patterns which in the past held societies together. In short, the world community is becoming more, both more interdependent and more fluid than it has been at any other time in history. Three. Modern transportation is rapidly mobilizing the peoples of the earth. The nations are coming out of their isolation, and distances which separate the different races are rapidly giving way before the extension of communication. Great cosmic forces have broken down the barriers which formerly separated the races and nationalities of the world and forced them into new intimacies and new forms of competition, rivalry, and conflict. And four, nowadays trains and ships can go everywhere, Countries on the other side of the globe seem on our doorstep, and it is impossible to govern one's own country with the door closed. The spirit of the age is one of openness, in which people from far and near are to be treated equally. The former rules have been abandoned in practice according to the trend of the times. Okay, I'll go through them. The first one is, um, any guesses? 1852. This is um, Frederick Douglass uh, actually writing about what the 4th of July means to, means to African Americans um, and somehow setting this as the context to understand it. And the phrase, space is comparatively annihilated, I believe he borrowed from, I forget who it was, but somebody in the U.S. Congress when they were showing off some of the first models of the, um, the telegram. And one of the um, rep representatives or senators jumped up and said, space is annihilated. <laughs> um, so this is, you, can, you can see the language repeating itself. This one here is 1957. This was spoken by Walt Whitman Rostow, or written by Walt Whitman Rostow and Max Millikan, um, who some of you may know as sort of the, the, the godfathers of modernization theory. Um, which I, I want to point out here is uh, uh, often in development theory, modernization theory is sort of put in contract, contrast to other theories like dependency or world systems, which supposedly emphasize the, the global connections more. And, and modernization theory supposedly focuses on nation by nation as separate containers, each going through their own particular stages. But if you read them carefully, this great moment of globalization, interconnection, and the, and the bringing together of isolated peoples is precisely the context in which, from which modernization theory begins its ideas. Um, this one, 1917, Robert Park. Um, 
Some of you may know Robert Park was a, a theorist of migration. He's probably best remembered, again, for nation-based theories, for assimilation theory. The idea that migrants all came to some place and it was this process of reincorporation into a new nation. But again, you read him carefully, his writing is just filled with great cosmic forces, you know, international and global competition. This is the context within which this stuff happens. It's only the memory that only focuses on these kinds of, the, the national dimensions of his work. Um, and the last one is Xie, um, Xie Fuchang. He was the um, Chinese ambassador to London in 1893. And this is part of his preamble in a famous memorial to the emperor. He's trying to encourage the emperor to um, drop the anti-emigration laws, which by that time were only you know, just empty letters on the book. But one thing I found, actually, is that when I'm looking for sort of non-Western globalization speak like this, they tend to be much less hyperbolic than what the Europeans and Americans were writing, which is odd. You would think that the Asians and Africans are being impacted by this even more than, than the Europeans, but indeed, they're, you can't quite see it, the moderation of the way to talk about this. But, um, did I make it I'm right? I got everyone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you can see this is, this is a genre of writing. Uh, the same phrases, the same images, the same processes are repeated for at least 160, 170 years here. It's this, it's this genre of newness. And, and with newness, it's not just a sense that new things are developing and there's progressive accumulation of newness. It's this right now is new. At this moment, the world is transforming. These isolated places are, are, are coming into this, this globally transformative moment. And the only thing that's consistent here is that 20 years later, they're going to look back and say, no, no, you, were taught, you, you lived in the era of isolation and stagnation. Now it is new. Now the, the isolated peoples are coming together. The ignorant are enlightened. No, no, 20, no, no, that was stagnation, this constant repetition of, of the newness. Um, what's going on in this? Um, indulge me for a moment. I'm, I'm just going to want to read one more quote. I think this is probably the the godfather of all globalization quotes. You'll, you'll <coughs> recognize this one. I read it because I think it still, it sets the gold standard for evocative images. I mean, and, um, but also it has an insight that um, I think isn't repeated in all of these. This is, of course, Marx and Engels' um, Communist Manifesto. The constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agita agitation distinguish the bourgeois epoch epoch from all earlier ones, all fixed, fast-frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away, all new-formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify, and the bourgeois, and here we go again, the rapid improvement of all instruments of production by the immensely facilitated means of communication draws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilization. In one word, it creates a world after its own images. Um, but what I want to focus on here is this, the first phrase, the uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, the everlasting uncertainty and agitation, distinguish this. And I think if you, if you read this carefully, he's talking about there's a certain politics of newness. For some reason, the creation of this world in its own image is dependent upon this constant reproduction of newness, this constant disturbance. It is new now. It is new now. It is new over and over. That this is somehow key to it, what, this politics of newness. And what, what exactly is it? What do I mean by a politics of newness here? I mean, whose politics is this? And what role does it play? I mean, one thing is that most of the time, the politics of newness is a politics of reform people who want to, to, to promote a change. And you have to describe this. This is a moment of crisis. This is a moment when the world is new or about to be new, and we need to readjust. Um, you know, asserting the newness is the first step to asserting a, a reform agenda. But I think really importantly here also is um, it's, a, a, it's a geopolitics of newness. All of these statements have a certain historical <coughs> vision of things that develop usually in Europe and at this moment are bursting out to incorporate the world. The world that is once isolated and separate is now becoming connected. And, and this 
and this serves two kinds of functions. One, it makes it look like difference around the world is a product, has been a product of the isolation of peoples, the lack of connections. Differences and inequalities are the product of, of isolation, and now we are overcoming this. And this also serves to obscure the extent to which differences and inequalities are, in fact, the product of historical connections, because you, you, know, you systematically forget those connections. I mean, the same sort of forgetting works with the reform. If we, un if we forget what's happened in the past, we can have these reform agendas that pretty much reproduce the same, the, the same technologies and the same methods that created the world we're now complaining about. But if we forget what, those, those, what created it, then we can reproduce those same reforms as the answer. And um, I'm going to go on and talk about migration as a way to um, illustrate what I'm talking about. But um, before I go into that, um, just a couple, a couple words more about what I mean here when I'm talking about globalization, some of the implications of it. It's, um, it's a word that, I mean, it's, it's one of those words that's terribly diffuse and a pain in the ass that's so hard to define and yet very useful to, to think through, in part because it does have this politics. And there's all kinds of causality. And people invoke this in order to invoke a vision of change. And it usually comes out that the idea that global flows, interactions, generate all kinds of transformative changes. Um, lots of more nuanced studies of globalization <coughs> emphasize the way that <coughs> borders and flows are mutually constructed, the way that homogenization and differentiation happens at the same time, contemporary globalization. Although even these scholars tend to, when they write their histories, they tend to write histories like this, histories of a European thing that suddenly expanded to include the world and not really including these insights into the history. I mean, if we start to think of these as mutually constructed processes, the history should look entirely different. Um, you know, most pe people who have looked at the history do admit that turn of the 20th century, um, if, if, if flows are a definition of globalization, per capita flows were as high as at the turn of the 21st century in terms of movement of people, movement of, of goods and trade. Mid 20th century is usually thought of as a trough in terms of these kinds of movements. 30s, 30s and 50s. Um, but if you look at it from a different way, look at it, say, the spread of certain kinds of institutions, um, perhaps institutions that make up the nation state. You know, in 1910, the world is still, I mean, it's just this, 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 this myriad of nation states, city states, colonies, dominions, territories, um, protectorates, you know, blah, 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 on and on, a multitude of different forms, you know, still some, you know, frontier areas unincorporated. By the 1960s, you know, 95% of the, you know, <coughs> populated land of the earth is controlled by nation states, some fairly homogenous institutions. I mean, this was perhaps, I think, the, the most homogenizing um, face of globalization ever, the spread of these fairly standardized institutions around the world into this international system of nation states. And yet these nation states and their borders are often taken to be precisely the opposite of globalization, the borders against flows, the things that stop the flows. And yet this is perhaps one of the greatest moments of spread ever. I mean, this is sometimes known as a kind of reaction against the earlier flows. but. It grows together, the flows and the nation states. So if you look in the 19th century, flows of information, you know, one of the prototypical globalization things. What is flowing around the world? Ideas about how you set up respectable diplomatic institutions, how you set up customs agencies, how you patrol your borders and control bandits within your borders, you know, control pirates on your sea coast, how you, how you set up um, courts and laws that protect private property, that facilitate trade, how you set up ports. There were informations about how to construct yourself as a secure, solid nation state, and for what? More often than not, it was precisely for the practice of facilitating trade. Maintaining borders and stabilizing a nation state was all about facilitating trade and giving institutions that could help make trade predictable and property protectable. Um, these, things, these two things come hand in hand, and that's how I want to, and I'm going to show some of the other ways in which the sort of regionalization and, and the flows come together hand in hand in migration. Um, <coughs> 
I'm, I'm going um, I'm, I'm to set up first some of the, some of the broad patterns of well, what, what you know, I call the first wave of global migration from, say, the 1830s to um, 1930s. Um, a lot of this comes to the, the article you mentioned, the Journal of World History. A lot of this is in there, and I'm going to rush through it pretty quickly, um, refer there just for some of the details and support. But first, to set the stage, this is just a migrate. This is proportion of the population that migrated. Um, just set the stage in Europe. Um, that you know, after about 1840, you know, d despite my, my 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 cynicism about the newness, I think the turn of the 19th century, uh, industrial revolution, the political revolutions, did create a new world in which this vocabulary of newness was one of the main features. But even if you measure it quantitatively in terms of migration, you're seeing these enormous leaps in numbers. This counts overseas migration, um, domestic migration. Um, I've, I've done back of the envelope calculations for Asia. And the, the, the levels from 1500 to 1800 are similar to Europe. It drags behind at about 1840 to 1900, but Asia catches up really quickly after 1900. And Europe stays about steadily. And where are these people going in this big boom of migration in the 19th century? Um, this is just counting pretty much people who got on ships, <coughs> um, long distance migration, and those who were registered to go across um, Siberia. Um, three major destinations for these long distance migrations. Um, one is you know, the, the one we're all familiar with, the transatlantic migrations, about 65% to the United States. The rest pretty much evenly divided between Canada, Brazil, Argentina, and a handful of other places like Uruguay, Cuba, and elsewhere in the Americas. Um, less familiar is a similar number into Southeast Asia, most of it into the Indonesian archipelago and mainland Southeast Asia, but all of the islands throughout Indian Ocean and South Pacific as well. About two thirds of those were from India. Um, and there are three-fifths of those from India, about two-fifths from China, about 20 million Chinese, 30 million Indians. And the other big space was into the swath of from Central Asia over to Northern Asia, Manchuria, Japan. Again, you've got about 30 million Chinese moving north into Manchuria. I forget some, 13 million Russians, um, Koreans, Japanese moving in there. Um, these, three lo these three major movements, about equivalent in number, and this is the point I want to emphasize, this movement is happening globally. Uh, if not exactly simultaneously, there's, there's a lag of about 10, 20 years from one flow to the other. Um, you may think, well, gosh, you know, 10 million people from Italy and 20 from China. China is such a big place. I mean, that's just a, a drop in the bucket compared to Italy. <coughs> But if you compare, say, regions of similar size and population, say Italy to, say, the counties in, um, of Guangdong and Fujian in South China, you can see that these are some peak immigration rates in world history. You can see in terms of density of emigration, they're very similar. As immigration is hitting these places with a, with a, with a similar kind of strength. You know, the same number of people moved into the United States from 1870 to 1920 as moved into mainland Southeast Asia, a much smaller region. Um, in other ways, you might mention that this. Um, one difference is that if you look at, say, total emigration from the three main sending regions compared to the population of 1900, about 10% of the people from India and China emigrated compared to 15% in Europe. So a bit of a difference there, but um, one of, 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 of scale, not of magnitude. Um, and this is only the tip of the iceberg. I mean, beyond this, within the sending region, into and out of Africa, within the receiving regions, millions, millions, millions more people are moving. And since the era, migration itself is increasing more quickly than global population is. Um, and you can see also, that, but these three main systems are important. You can see you're getting a redistribution of world population. If you look at the first four lines from 1800 to 1950, the top three colors with the diagonal, those are the main receiving frontiers, the Americas, Southeast Asia, North Asia. The bottom three things are the main sending regions, Europe, India, China. You can see a redistribution of population away from the major sending areas to these big front frontiers. You're getting a you know, reshaping of the global population here. So the, these migrations are, are significant. Um, this, here's some more charts over time. You can see sort of a, a flat, these are the three major groups. You can see a flattening out in the global depression of the 1870s to early 1890s. 
a huge peak right before World War I, a bit of a trough, then that peak matched again in the 1920s. And, um, and then the third, the depression kind of kills a lot of it. Um, one of the points to make up here is that most, many accounts of historical globalization and migration say it was over in 1914. Um, just not true at all. I mean, any measurement of flow in the 1920s reattained the peaks of pre-World War I, especially if you look at the world and not just the Atlantic world. For migration, because of the U.S. migration laws, you do see a bit of a decline across the Atlantic. But to, to Latin America, it kept at the same rates, and globally, we reached the same peaks. But um, you know, the point is here, all of this migration, I mean, the, these cycles are fairly simultaneous. I mean, all these places are linked. I mean, the, the factories and slaughterhouses in Chicago are linked to the, you know, the, the, the cattle of, of the Pampas and, and, the, and, the, and the Midwest. Um, and they're linked to tin mines in, in, in Malaysia and rubber plantations in the Amazon and Malaysia, which are linked to these new rice fields being reclaimed in, in Southeast Asia and soybean fields of Manchuria, which are providing food to feed the people who are working in the mines and plantations. They're providing the raw material to, to, um, to, 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 for people to work in these factories who are also being filled. All of this stuff is linked around the world and through transportation, the spread of transportation. And it's increasingly linked. This is a, this is a figure of return migrants um, as a portion of emigrants. Three main flows, Europeans returning from the US, Chinese returning from abroad, and Indians from abroad. Um, one thing the economists, I think, have shown fairly convincingly is that short-term cycles in return migration correspond pretty well with employment cycles. When employment abroad is high, um, return rates are low. When employment abroad isn't very good, return rates are high. So you can see these peaks, like in the 1930s, you know, when employment is bad, return rates are high. And what you also see here is by the 1890s, these return cycles around the world are starting to converge in their cycles. I mean, if indeed you have to understand return in context of the economy, the global economy is starting to converge in a big way in the 1890s. And what amazes me here is converging not only in terms of the cycles, it's converging in terms of the amplitudes. I mean, the, the absolute proportions are becoming more and more similar for all these groups. I mean, this just, I find, amazing. I mean, you think somehow travel distance and other things might influence that, but, but even the amplitudes are starting to converge. Um, let me just give you one more sense of convergence. Female, rates of female immigration. These are, this is Chinese migration to different parts of the world. And Singapore is really high. Other places are relatively low. All of them, after some stagnation, start to grow after about the 1910s. 1920s pick up even more. The 1930s, they just boom, go really high. Less dramatically, but to some extent, you see the same patterns in different European, the female proportion of different European groups going to America. Fairly steady throughout much of the 19th century, picks up slowly in the 1910s and 20s and in the 30s. I mean, not only are they all raising, but the, but the female rates are starting to converge as well. The same proportions in all these groups. And I mean, this is interesting. Not only do you see this convergence, but you see it happening really strongly in the 1930s precisely when the flows of migration are declining. So if we're going to see globalization as quantity of flows, the 1930s is a low point. If we're going to see globalization as homogenization of certain patterns, whether it be return patterns, female migration, the world is more globalized than ever in the 1930s in terms of the way people migrate, the structure of migration. Um, but I'm talking here of convergence. And yet at the same time, I started out with these three distinct systems. Um, the patterns of return and female migration become increasingly similar across the systems. Are these systems also starting to increasingly integrate? What you actually find is the opposite. These three systems are becoming increasingly distinct over time, especially in the 1880s and 90s. The 1850s and 60s, you want to look where Asians and Europeans are going. They're crossing in all directions. You can't quite define these systems so clearly. 
but increasingly <coughs> over time, Asians go to Asians, Europeans go to the Americas. Everybody sticks to their particular system. Here's some, uh, a chart of Chinese migration from the 1850s to um, 1940. The black is um, Chinese migrants to the Americas and Australia, and the other one is overall Chinese migration. You can see up till the 1870s, about 40% of all Chinese were going to the Americas and Australia. But this remains stagnant in terms of absolute numbers. Even as Chinese migration itself increased 20-fold, you see the migration to the Americas stagnating. Well, what you're seeing is the Pacific becoming a border. I mean, dividing, dividing the world into these systems is even as density, the quantity of flows itself, increases. Um, this is, again, Indian migration. Indian migration is never quite such a great proportion outside of Southeast Asia, but it was more completely just nipped in the bud, completely, you know, completely eradicated to nothing by, by, by the early 20th century. Again, the world being divided into these, these different kinds of, these different spheres here. Um, and, I mean, this creation of the world to these separate spheres, I mean, this is, this is a space of forgetting, too. I mean, I, I would imagine for most of you, I mean, these numbers beyond the Atlantic are, are somewhat fresh. You're unfamiliar with it. I mean, if you look through most of the historiography, I mean, they say, oh, 90% of migrants were across the Atlantic. Um, there, there, wasn't, there was only some indentured migrants in, of Asians and not a whole lot going on. You know, I, and this whole thing of indenture, I should emphasize, you know, less than 3% of Chinese were ever indentured to Europeans, less than 10% of Indians. Indenture was not the main mode of migration. Most, you know, <coughs> migrated through family and other kinds of debt obligations, much like Europeans. But this kind of knowledge, this, this division, this regionalization, also helped regionalize knowledge about migration. The Atlantic migrations are emblematic of the modernity, the adventurousness, the transformations going on in the Atlantic, the lack of migration elsewhere, you know, depicts sort of the stagnation and backwardsness of those places. But then I looked, I was trying to figure out, you know, most numbers for, to count Chinese migration, English language literature, range from three million to seven million. I mean, you look at the basic, you know, Chinese customs reports and Singapore Harbor Master reports, and it's easy to find data, and it's easy to count 20 million people. So I look at the footnotes, where are you getting these numbers? And you know, it's secondary, it's something you shouldn't do to your colleagues. It's really, <laughs> it's really awful. You know, it's secondary sources referring to secondary sources referring to secondary sources, going back to three articles that were very self-consciously counting indentured migrants, coolies. And I mean, I think nobody does this consciously, but somewhere built into the knowledge, the knowledge of Chinese migration is you want to know about Chinese, you count indenture, you count the coolies, you count those who are laboring for Europeans. Um, and if you know that, you know that all there is to know. This, in a, you know, a subliminal way, just got built into the very fabric of our knowledge about Asian, Asian migration. <coughs> um, what you find, ironically, is that um, when you know, the British were first looking for people to indenture, and they looked at Chinese in the 40s and 50s, they liked the Chinese, because they thought the Chinese were very free migrants. They understood business. They, they knew contracts. They had these great recruitment flows already. These are going to be people easy to recruit. And what actually happened is that the British just couldn't compete with the Chinese recruiters. Over and over again, they lost out. They tried to place blame. And increasingly, the blame went on the Chinese. It was incoherent, but the Chinese are, are too corrupt. Their government is corrupt. They cheat each other, only through kidnapping. Why do we fail? It's because the Chinese themselves are so corrupt and so immobile and just can't, just can't deal with, with backwards people like this. In a way, it was you know, the British's own attempt to their failure to, to, to deal with the free market in Chinese that made them depict this as, as, as a, an unfree world of migration in Asia. And then these ideas of unfree Asians, you know, have, have since circulated as common knowledge about Asian migration. And in the very direct way, you know, people in the U.S. Congress and um, judges in the U.S. Supreme Court cited this kind of discourse to justify emigration laws against these people who are not truly free migrants, people who, who shouldn't be allowed in here like European migrants. In a very concrete way, this division, this cultural division across the Pacific between you know, Asia and the Americas was also the place for the pioneering of what we would call the first border laws, the concrete institutions 
to, to police borders and identify people crossing borders for precisely the space of dividing the world between East and West, Asian, you know, American, and, and, and non-Asian. And this is, um, I'm going to skip over some stuff here just to bring this into sort of the, the, this legacy of, of newness. But um, um, th this is what my, this published a book, Melancholy Order, and this is what it discusses. The, the emergence of modern migration law through the control of Asians in the 1890s to about the 1910s. Um, and, um, and you know, the argument says it's through this control that you first get the idea that migration control should happen at borders and that it is the unilateral right of the receiving nations to pass immigration laws as it wishes. Unlike trade, which we still negotiate, I mean, the middle of the 19th century was very liberal ideas about free migration, free mobility, and it's the context of excluding Asians that you first start to formulate and justify what we now know as the corpus of modern migration law, um, the techniques, how do you identify somebody, the, the centralized paperwork, the central, how, how do you know who somebody is from a foreign country? These kinds of things went on. And then by the 1920s, the general diffusion of these practices, these principles around the world as something once designed to keep the Asians out of the West, but now as just the norms of migration relations between all nations. And my book is about that. And just what I want to say here is some of the legacy of this in terms of the politics of, um, the politics of newness here. Because um, again, I I've set up here, we have this simultaneous increase of flows but division, regionalization, and, 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 um, and this, these new spaces in which we can forget the rest of the world in order to claim, oh, only now are we incorporating them again. And the 1920s is one of the first times when this politics of newness, in terms of at least migration reform, really takes root. The 1920s is precisely the moment when what I was talking about, these new, these new techniques of migration control, are getting pretty much consolidated as a global norm. I mean, these things are new, they're modern, and at this very same moment, you're getting this really strong movement of reform, about how all this stuff is bad, how, how we really need to have more humane, better modes of, of, of regulating migration. And, um, but when they talked about what, it was what was bad, and they looked at migration law, they always depicted it as the legacy of the old regime of old absolutist states. They, they, they completely failed to admit that these are a very new thing that only emerged since the 1880s and talk about it in terms of old absolutist states. Um, like for example, at the Institute for, um, oh, I forget the Pacific Relations that met, met in Hawaii. You know, one of the, um, the common comments you heard was that, you know, talking about migration across the Pacific, um, people would say things like questions reserved for domestic jurisdiction, are the remnants of what a comparatively short time ago was unlimited state sovereignty. There is now a clear tendency for questions to pass from the sphere of purely domestic interest and jurisdiction into the sphere of international agreement. Now we are entering this new age where, where the nations cooperate with each other, where we are more humane towards migrants and we understand the interests of nations. We're enlightened now. Um, and they're always insane. Of course, it's going to be the most free and progressive countries that lead the way in this. And they usually have the United States in mind when they say this, of course, is leading the way in ever more restrictive migration laws in this time period. Every, and, and more than anything, it's really the one, the one state along with Australia that around the world emphasizes and reiterates migration law as a sovereign issue. It is not an international issue and yet it also manages to fit itself in here as the, the side of reform and the, these new progressive and enlightened nations. And, um, and ironically, of course, as, you know, as many of you may know, historians of globalization tend to look at the 20s and 30s, even though they've talked about themselves as this new moment of international cooperation, historians now tend to look at it as the moment of deglobalization in history, when everybody got nationalist and put up the boundaries and in the 30s it was all over. And this is sort of the framework for these you know, new, new discussions of um, reform in the present. And I'm just going to use one example of um, some of the ways the International Organization of Migration talks about <coughs> migration and migration reform. Um, I, I use them because they have a very international vision and also they draw, I think, very well from some of the, from, from contemporary social science on migration. 
Um, but they, of course, set the stage about we are in this era of newness and, and crisis. Um, we have this new mobility that diverges from the classic forms of migration. Um, we have new sources and new destinations, no longer just tradi traditional countries of immigration. And of course, their vision of historical migration is only the Atlantic, only place, and the traditional countries are the US, um, Argentina, Brazil. I mean, I mean, as far as numbers, you know, Malaysia, um, 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 Sri Lanka, Burma, e even. Um, you know, parts of Thailand have as many proportional immigrants as anywhere in the Americas, but of course, <coughs> that's not noted. That now, of course, we have new diasporic and transnational formations. It's no longer monodirectional stuff. This is something else again. You see the high return rates. People are communicating. I mean, just the very correspondence of these kinds of things of employment lets you know there is very intensive communication going across these, these spaces. That migration is eroding traditional boundaries. Again, these are the classics, the classic link of, of sovereignty and, and migration control. You know, the political scientists always project back the Treaty of Westphalia. No, migration control, this is something that emerges in the 1880s. This is really, is border control really linked to sovereignty in a big way. And you know, that defies cultural traditions and national identities and political institutions and therefore we are in a migration governability crisis. Um, we have this thing that's never happened before in world history, and we've had this new crisis we have to deal with. And they give you the proposals of how to deal with it. And um, the solution is always an international immigration management framework. And again, we need lots of international agreements that still respect national sovereignty. Um, and again, they often use the 20s and 30s as a time when people just didn't understand international agreements. Everybody just thought about themselves. But of course, the reform, there, there were plenty of international agreements about migration in the 20s. And back then, if you, uh, if you look at the way they talk about themselves, they always, the people in the 20s talk about the past. Everybody in the 19th century was so extreme. Either they believed in total immigration, or total, total freedom of immigration, or total state sovereignty. But we now are more enlightened, and we understand this middle path that balances them both. And the IOM is saying essentially the same thing. We understand that middle path, and we will go out there and help you in your negotiations to find that middle path between the two. Um, more sophisticated identification technologies. I mean, this has been always a trope of migration control. You know, fingerprints, photographs, Bertillon systems, anthropometric measurement over and over again. This is going to solve the problems. Um, I sh uh, more statistics, of course, in the 20s and 30s was a fantastic time for collecting. Actually, you know, since the 1880s. I mean, you can find such fantastic. Actually, I think pre-World War II migration statistics are even better than contemporary ones in many ways. Um, just because, because of that next one, more sophisticated immigration categories. Are you a merchant? Are you a family member? Are you a student? Are you this kind of student? Are you that kind of student? Are you this kind of laborer? Are you a guest laborer? The proliferation of these distinct categories that are always promoted as being able to better serve the entrance of migrants and the state. But these are one of the things that makes it impossible to count migration now because all you can count is categories. Um, whereas before, at least you're counting people got on and off ships, which have had its, um, had its own problems. But now the statistics are even more incoherent than they ever were in the past, even as there's this constant vocabulary of only now are we refining migration statistics. Um, um, and, um, and of course, the, the whole point of this is to protect the rights of migrants and needs of nations. And what you're getting here is that, um, you know, you're, you're forgetting the extent to which migration, again, was a global and transformative thing for 200 years, if not more now. But what it does more than else, it presents the present as this new world, which demands new and aggressive intervention to make this new world more orderly. And also what you do by this forgetting and by recasting the past as this different world of, of isolated sovereignties that were not characterized by connections, you also obscure the extent to which the kinds of ways migration was managed then were pretty much the same methods that you are proposing to manage now. They are the methods that made this horrible world that you're trying to overcome now. And you are going to overcome by reproducing these same kinds of, kinds of technologies. So this, I think, is uh, the geopo what the geopolitics of newness does. And in many ways, it is a, it is a justification of, of the repetition of a certain kind, a certain kind of power. Um.
And that's it. I'd love to hear your, your comments and questions. Okay, so um, we, we, we've got uh, a man with a mission here today. Uh, you can tell that this is a strong uh, sort of argument about uh, against the ways uh, some of us have been thinking about immigration. And uh, maybe we can just open this up and see if people have some questions for Adam. I have a question. Um, if I understand your argument correctly, you're arguing that um, the, there, that people may think there's a convergence of patterns and structures, but you're arguing that it's not converging. Correct? This. Um, can you just rephrase that, and then I want to ask you a question, just to make sure I'm um, Yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. There's all kinds of theories about globalization, but there's very often this, in many accounts, that these international flows is, is very causal mm -hmm. of all kinds of things, and it brings the world together. And I've shown two ways. Sometimes things don't necessarily flow in correspondence. I mean, the, the flows of people and goods and the flows of information and the homogenization of institutions, these may flow according to very different cycles. And the other one is that, my other point is that the increasing density of flows doesn't mean a world coming together. It could also be reorganized into these spaces of difference, these, these separate directions, these separate systems. And that these separate systems help justify, help set the foundation for this politics of newness, which says, oh, those people who are different than us, it's not because they've been connected to all these patterns, it's because they're isolated. It's because they're of, of, of this different nature. But if you look at the actual structures of migration, you can see increasingly in terms of return rates, female migration, they're increasingly similar, even as the destinations and the, and the systemic patterns are increasingly segregated from each other. That's the argument in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I was just, it seems like there's um, all these, a lot of different layers of this idea of convergence and then distinctions. Mm -hmm. And I was trying, it seems like it's almost contradictory in some ways, what you're arguing. And so I, I wondered if you could no, I guess I'm not convinced quite of the argument. I agree, with, I agree with what you're saying, but at the same time, I'm not sure if it's really about convergence or distinct patterns, but rather um, it depends on what where you go in. And yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's what I'm trying to say, okay, is that I what you're think. Okay. Yeah, it depends what you look at. I mean, the way, and then sometimes, if, I often say, if you define it as homogenization, mm -hmm. you can see that at certain places and certain times. If you define globalization as quantity of flows, the quantity of interaction. You can see that rising, and these are things you can measure at mm -hmm. certain times, and you can find it rising and falling. But these things don't necessarily correspond to each other. They sometimes do and sometimes don't. And you can see it as the interlocking, if you see it as the interlocking of flows, and the increasing glo global, the emphasis on globalization of flows, you can see that sometimes. At other times you see flows becoming increasingly regionalized, increasingly segregated in distinct systems. And Yes, it's contradictory. Uh, well, it's contradictory only if you assume from the beginning that globalization is this homogenous entity that makes yeah. certain kinds of things happen together, which it's not. But I, I was thinking that you also made a kind of a temporal distinction. Mm -hmm. I thought that um, the convergence of the flows that you were describing for us sounded relatively conventional. So an old guy like me would think mm -hmm. about it in terms of sort of capitalism. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and if you just, just take one piece of that, let's say Chinese immigration, it looked like there was quite a bit of convergence. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, kind of holds up to a certain point. And then you go into a later period when your, your three systems become much more distinct. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> The answer to this last the, the the question and your response to it was quite general, but I mean a historian would say that this something's changed. I mean, you know, not, oh, not yeah, yeah, you, yeah, so yeah. so the one question that I had for you about this was about um, the complexity here is splendid. Uh, but I'm wondering if there's anything wrong with uh, in that early period, I got this feel for sort of deep forces, you know, I mean, like, uh, you, you get this tremendous convergence, you know, how can you have that convergence unless you, you have some, yeah. some of those forces at work? And then in the later period, what, that's grossly oversimplified, 
then in the later period, grossly oversimplifying once again, what seems to happen is that you basically get state intervention, mm -hmm. and that's shaped a lot by sort of new racial knowledges, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which in turn to some degree maybe oh. are a reflection of all oh, this. Oh, yeah, sort of, yeah, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's, that's so yeah. maybe my oversimplification of uh, all this would allow you to sort of uh, yeah, uh, um, stake out your ground a little bit. I, I, well, your, your insights are, right. I should say one of the contexts I put this in is, I do think the last 200 years, I mean, since the turn of the 19th century, it is a, in some sense, a new world. There's lots of people talk about early modern globalization. That certainly set up certain kinds of things going on upon which the modern world is built. But since then, we've been, I sometimes phrase as working out the, um, just the implications of the new modern world of industrialization, of the international system, of these new kinds of political ideals but they're working out in terms of these tensions that constantly get repeated over and over again in different kinds of, different kinds of formats. You know, sort of, I always kind of, I kind of hate to say the borders versus flows things because I think they grow up together, but as often as not, they're put in tension with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got the protectionists against the free traders kinds of arguments just, you know, being repeated since, you know, List and the, and the British talking mm -hmm. since the 1830s. I mean, you get this kind of stuff repeated over and over again. So, I mean, but at every age, you got everybody, of course, saying, but this is a new global moment. But usually everybody who claims this is a new global moment is frankly taking, I think, taking a partisan side in one of these, in one of these tensions. But what you're saying, so in sort of the deep forces, yeah, I, I, th I think that way too. I sort of like deep forces stuff. But I'm, try I'm trying to <laughs> depict these deep forces as this big 200-year yeah. process. That's still, we've, we've even you know, barely come close to to it starting to, to even out and reach any kind of equilibrium. Um, but, um, and yeah, as far as this, this segregation, yes, I mean, the state intervention is in there. And I think one of my cases I tried to make at the beginning was it's precisely a spread of nation states that you have to conceive as part of this process. And, and that's why I think it's making the Pacific into a divide. It's a great place where you see sort of these, these cultural ideals and, and very active state intervention that's happening hand in hand, one creating the other. Um. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's just so interesting that you're talking about this without using the word empire. You know, given, <laughs> given your time period, if you're starting 1852 and going at least through 1917, you know, thinking about how often people distinguish between our own like, globalized age and earlier you know, ages of empire, and so much of your time period would be in that, you know, payday of formal mm -hmm. empire. And just if you could comment, a little bit more on that and a part on it, you know, I'm just, I love the stuff you started with and, and the, the either, you know, the denial of the earlier history or, or the inability of the earlier histories to sink in mm -hmm. and how that might be related to the idea of, you know, imperial geographies and how, you know, some aspects of connection might have been recognized in others and other, yeah. you know, sublimated. So I don't know if you could, it's not exactly a question, but no, just no, <laughs> you know, an invitation time. to yeah. talk more about Yeah, those I mean, one of the reasons I started out avoiding empires because I, I started out with a, a Sinocentric perspective and Chinese migrants went everywhere. They crossed every border into every empire and into plenty of places like Siam and the Americas and non-imperial spaces. And I just couldn't use empire. I mean, and these patterns were, and some of the overall demographics were similar to things like the Indians, who, whose migration was pretty much constrained to within the empire. But from that sort of sort of the economic background, I. I didn't think that empire was the way to explain the the common the commonalities, at least, of these global uh, 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 the global growth of this migration. Um, but and another thing, but if you want to get into more detail, I think the empires are there. But another thing I've always been cautious of is the tendency. Oh, we speak of empire to kind of homogenize the effects of empire which I don't think is really the case at all. I mean, you look at the British Empire, the dynamics of migration to the white settler dominions and of in Indians and within um, um, you know, Asian colonies is very, very different. And one thing you often find is even though with Indian migration, the empire pretty much defined the limits of where Indians went to, you can find numerous examples of, with both Chinese and Indians, planters being unsatisfied with their access to labor and trying to override the markets 
and you know, get more labor into their plantations or control it better, consistently failing, consistently being able to, un to compete with Asian recruiters and Asian management and just the markets. But in some ways, the Britain, British are seen as a prototypical empire of migration, and yet in some ways they, they failed to manage it over and over again, as compared to say, if you want to find the space where empire matters, that's North Asia, Russia, Japan, and to a lesser extent the Qing Empire, those are the spaces that maintained empire within their boundaries. Migration just corresponded with the expansion in, of, of borders into Northeast Asia, where even in the 1930s, coerced and semi-coerced migration just override the markets continuously. I mean, that's the space where empire and migration is you can't talk about migration without empire in North Asia. But in other places, it works out very differently. And then like in you know, the French and Dutch empires, migration within those spaces across them, very, very different from the British empire. So um, it's at this mid-level, I think, that you just start talking about empire. And I'm, I'm sticking to kind of the global level where I think it's those, we have the phrase deep forces there, but, but something, but something that is a context for empire as well as for migration. But you want to understand some of the specifics of the government intervention, the creation of these systems, then you have to look at empire, but specific empires and specific policies within these empires to, to understand the distribution of migrants. Um, that's where I stand for now, at least. It's not only the distribution. I mean, you were talking with your quotation from Fu Chang uh, and commenting on the, um, what you saw as the oddness, you know, in terms of it's not as hyperbolic. Sure. And so part of it's like the situational politics. Mm -hmm. You know, what it would mean, you know, to use it. the word open door, you know, mm -hmm. is in there and to think about yeah. like extraterritoriality and treaty port, you know, privileges there. and then to be, you know, thinking about migration and that imperial yeah, you know, that's another system thing. would help, you know, answer that question. Yeah, and that's another thing where, again, I come from so much research in the U.S. China relations in terms of creating migration policy. And I think one of the key things is that the U.S. at this point when doing lots of stuff was not relating to China or Japan as an empire yet. In fact, the British Empire relating to Japan managed to avoid so many of these questions by referring things to the complexities of imperial politics and their relations to the dominions where the U.S. had to confront China and Japan directly over and over and hash out these things with them and really became the model for so much migration policy and lots of the racial stuff happened at this space as well, even within the British Empire, this migration was something that, one of the key things that's always even threatening the breakup of the empire. I mean, if anything got Australia and South Africa angry at London, it was migration. Um, because they still had this idea, this is the space of free migration that the, the British Empire in the 1880s and 90s. And, um, and um, this just made Australia and South Africa angry to no end over and over again. It was a space of dissolution of empire as much as it was a space of consolidation of the world. So it's, it's a complicated relationship there. And when, and as much as sort of this, this racialized construction of the world, it happened in imperial spaces, but it also happened in spaces of constructing nation states, of constructing alternatives to, to empire. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's my where I fit there. I, I think that is what you're referring to. Um. Do you have a question? Oh, no, no. Huh? Just one. Okay, same one. Other? I had another question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, I'm curious about the time frame that you're working in, and if, um, because some of this, these sort of, uh, the globalization speak that you talk about, you could find quotes beyond 1957. Oh, sure, sure. The same yeah. thing, and I'm just wondering if it would, have you thought about thinking about some of the same kind of patterns to expand the argument time-wise, oh. or, I, I, don't, I don't know if it would change your argument, but I was just curious if you thought no, about No, sure, that. I mean, that's, yeah, the implicit time frame, because all the globalization speak of the present. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, all the quotes from it to make you think about stuff you've surely read yeah. in the present. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, I mean, if, and I finish, and I think this, I mean, I think all of that is the intensification of this politics of newness. And one of the things some of the people who study the flow is some of the stuff they say too is, 
look, over the past 20, 30 years, they've also had the regionalization of trade. Even as it's increased, it's become more regionalized. Um, I mean, these, these, these things happen repeatedly. Um, and yeah, I guess I've got you know, no more to say specifically other than that this kind of stuff is, it's, it's, this is a politics that still is a potent politics. So do you have like a, a so what chapter of this book you're writing that <laughs> kind of says, well, okay, so now, now what? Like for policy makers and, and for the International Organization of Migration, you know, basically you're saying, what, do you, what, do, what, how should their website be? You know, I mean, they're saying the same things. And when the book is finished, the conclusion was painful. <laughs> I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it, and I still hate it. Yeah. And it is, um, I have nothing to say about policy whatsoever. <laughs> okay. um, it's pretty much, this is the world as it is, and yeah. I don't know yeah. what we can do about it. Well, I, I, I was very interested in this um, remark on indentured uh, labor, which, um, of course, has been made elsewhere, that there's decline of it, and that it was unenforceable. But, um, you know, that's policy panacea today is the so-called guest workers program with mm -hmm. <laughs> same old, same old. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that difficult to, uh, mm -hmm. to make the connection even if you didn't do it. No, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, 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 give this, I give this list of resonances, historical mm -hmm. resonances of stuff going on today, but in terms of, and so what do we do about it? I don't know, there's too much entrenched, <laughs> too much entrenched stuff. Uh, the only quotation I got correct on date, and certainly not authorship, was the first one, mm -hmm. because of the reference of steam, and I right. thought, that's <laughs> got to be... <laughs> <laughs> so that leads to the question, to what extent technology yeah. comes into this, either technology of transportation, technology of communication, technology of, you know, uh, economics, of financial flows, I mean, just yeah. sending payments home. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all this stuff is a factor in migration, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I don't know if there's, it's not so much a limit, it's just a mean, so. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I, um, I used to be a big techno-skeptic. I mean, the, 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 the means of communication are oh. always there. They're, they're faster now, but I've always wondered, right, so right. what? And so right. what if they're faster? What difference does it make? Yeah. But I actually... And less of a techno skeptic now, because mm -hmm. I spent time with these these folks in I met in Thailand. They're Lao speaking Thais, and they're doing business with um, they're buying cheap stuff in Chinatown and Bangkok and in Laos and sending it to people they know in Australia or in Italy. They're not other Thais. I mean, they're not working through ethnic business networks. I and mean, one of the things an ethnic business network does is it reinforces trust. I mean, if you've got kinship relations, village relations, right. other kinds of, you know, ethnic consolidation, this helps you trust somebody, which is really important when the turnaround is long. But these folks I met, they're not using, they, 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 they can't even write English, they can speak English. I mean, so one thing, it really helps them. They can, I mean, cell phones help them communicate, um, which they couldn't do in some of the older things. But also I find that, and they aren't <coughs> dealing with other Thais or Laos abroad, they're dealing directly with Italians and Australians who most of the time they just met blankly in the markets. I mean, they approached them in the markets and say, I'll help you. But the reason it could work is when you have this rapid turnaround of communication, you, know, you can send a small shipment over and you can wait for payment and, if it, and, and you, 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 can make, you can start out making really small risks at the beginning and you can learn to trust yourself because you've got really good turnover time. So one thing I think that technology is doing is it, helping to build connections beyond the old kinds of ethnic trade trade networks. And we often read about the, the cell phones and the you know, Dominicans who are always talking to each other at home. I think the real thing is it's helping people to connect across those boundaries when they, when, when they take the effort. I mean, a lot of people use technology just to reinforce their own narrow, their own narrow circuit, but it makes a possibility of building trust more easily. So that's, that's one thing that I think has overcome some of my technical skepticism, but I still don't really know what the, yeah. anything it's not else. A deep but force. Huh? You're not saying it's a deep force. Then. <laughs> not saying. One of the deep forces is not technology. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay. no. Um, well, yes, it is. I mean, okay. it's, we have, we've had this consistent growth of technology over the past 200 years. I mean, this is at, at the heart of all of this. They're just saying, oh my God, I'm talking to these people over there like I never had before. Mm -hmm. So it's always there. But um, you know, 
But my skepticism is I'm not going to talk about the enormous new internet age or the new mm -hmm. cell phone age, yeah. which makes 1990s different from anything in history before. Um, it, it is a force, but it's a 200-year force, not, 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 not the now force. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we should wind up for the day, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.